Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Bob Pasnow. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Western Civilization, Thought, and Policy. And uh, we're here tonight because we're uh, revving up to do the thing that we do every year, which is to think about who's going to be our next uh, visiting scholar of conservative thought and policy. Uh, many of you will know Bob Kaufman, who's here this year as our uh, visiting scholar. Uh, and many of you will also know some of the previous ones. Bob this year is our fifth. We're looking ahead next year to number six. And the person we've invited out to talk to us about it is uh, the man standing next to me here, Professor Stephen Presser. Uh, he is the uh, Raoul Berger Professor of Legal History Emeritus now, I guess, at Northwestern University Law School. Uh, he's the author of, um, I have just the short form of his uh, CV, but the short form lists six books and many, many more articles than I was uh, willing to count. Uh, the books are on constitutional law, law and jurisprudence, business law, uh, the legal history of American law professors over the last couple hundred some years, um, and uh, the best title of them all is a book entitled Piercing the Corporate Veil, which sounds intriguing. Um, I heard him give a class this morning on, um, of all things, Marx's Communist Manifesto. Um, and um, I think none of you were there for it, which is a shame, because it was an absolutely wonderful class. And that makes me confident that you're in for quite a treat tonight. So I'm just going to stop talking and hand things over to Professor Presser. As you can see, the title of his talk tonight is, Do Law Professors Really Understand American Law? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, the <laughs> After that marvelous introduction, uh, the only thing I want to say is lower your expectations. Um, all I try to do in a nice public lecture like this is get out of here without permanent tissue damage on either side. Um, I'm going to talk to you about law professors. Uh, the title of the talk is Do Law Professors Really Understand American Law? Uh, there's one exception. My colleague Bill Pitsy, who's out there in the audience, is my law school classmate. He's a law professor. He does understand American law. But the profession as a whole has some difficulties, and that's what I want to explore with you. I'm going to make a political connection. But first, let's think of the image. Law professors, what about them? OK, there's your archetypical law professor. That's uh, John Houston from The Paper Chase. And that's what people think of. More about that in just a minute or two. When I give a talk like this, uh, I've learned that it's a good idea to give you a road map, to give you takeaways. I teach management school students a lot. They always want the takeaways. So here are the takeaways from tonight. I'm going to suggest that we are a divided nation and that we are divided, among other things, on jurisprudence, on basic attitudes toward the law. I'll say a word or two about the president. Say what you will about the president. He has a rather interesting take on what kind of people ought to become justices. You know one of them, and I'll show you a picture of that man who I think is a very extraordinary and outstanding jurist. Then I want to go back to an earlier period, and I want to talk a little bit about the way things once were. I guess I'm romanticizing this earlier period a little bit, but not really too unreasonably, as you'll see. But then I'm going to explain how things changed. And I'm going to introduce you to a villain, a villain, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., okay? the most famous, probably, uh, jurist in America, a law professor for a little while. And thus, I think he's fair game to talk about. After Holmes, things, I think, just kept getting worse and worse. To give you just a little bit of a sense of what I'm talking about, in the academy, law became malleable. And law became something a little too close, I believe, to politics. And I want to ask tonight to be a little bit provocative. Is there something better than that out there? I do think 
there is some hope, and I think we might want to go back to the past for shaping the future. But before I go any further, I should make completely clear that informing my recollections today is this book, okay? Law Professors, Three Centuries of Shaping American Law by Me. It's only a year old, and I have to tell you, particularly at this point in the year, it makes an absolutely wonderful Christmas, <laughs> or birthday, or wedding, or bar mitzvah present, if you're looking for something. Everything I'm going to say is covered in this book, and most of the pictures that I'm going to show you are about people who are chapters in the book. Okay, so that's what we're thinking. And if you buy only one book on the history of legal education this year, it should be that one. Let's move on, all right? I'm starting with a position that ours is a divided country, okay? That last election in 2016 showed us that. Maybe you've seen this map. It's really fascinating, this geographical map. That's a map by state, okay, the blue states, for Mrs. Clinton, the red states for Donald Trump. Now, if that wasn't dramatic enough, if you look at a map by county, it's even more extraordinary, okay? In the coastal areas, in the big cities, in the academic communities, you get one view, but in most of the rest of the country, it's another one. Now, what does that have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, a little appreciated statistic, I think it's accurate, is that the voters in some exit polls, when asked, 60% said, you know, one of the concerns for me was the appointments these candidates are going to make to the judiciary. So the thesis that I'm going to advance is there is a very different view about law held by our two political parties. More about that in a few minutes, okay? The Republicans hold one view, the Democrats hold another. I would go further. I'm not sure in our entire history that this particular phenomenon has ever existed before. I wanted to explore that in the book. I wanted to think about that. There was a second thing I wanted to think about. And you might think of this second thing as the popular view of law professors. The person who expressed it most strikingly was that man. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I meant, meant to indicate before I got to that who the president's model justice is. It's that man, Antonin Scalia. He recently passed away. But he made clear, the president did, that that's who he was thinking about. That's his view of jurisprudence. And indeed, his list of potential justices came from the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation, quite well-respected academic conservative institutions. He did pick one. There he is. You know him. He's your local Supreme Court justice, Neil Gorsuch. Now, what about Neil Gorsuch? What about this Republican view of the law? I think the way to describe it is the terms usually used to talk about Scalia textualists or adherence to the original understanding. What's that mean? A textualist is somebody who doesn't read things into the law, but who just looks for a plain meaning. An originalist is someone who tries to understand, well, when the framers put together the Constitution, what were they thinking? And uses that as the lodestar of interpretation. There's a different view. This is the view these days of Republicans, there's a different view. I'll tell you about that in a couple of minutes. This perspective, and when I state it like that, I think it sounds reasonably sensible. But this perspective is way, way out of favor these days. So one question I wanted to answer was, how did we reach this political divide? How did this come to be? That was one question. Now, as I indicated a little bit earlier, there is a second question that I wanted to answer. And the person who brought that most to mind for me was that man. That's Leon Panetta, okay? Longtime member of Congress, a Democrat, a former White House Chief of Staff, a former CIA director, 
and a former Secretary of Defense. You don't come any more distinguished than that. He said of this man, when he began to think about how Mr. Obama was conducting himself, and Mr. Obama is a subject in one of the chapters in my book. He's our first law professor president, President Obama. Leon Panetta said of him, listen to this, his most conspicuous weakness was a frustrating reticence to engage his opponents and rally support for his cause. I don't think Panetta was actually being critical, really, but he was lamenting a sort of interesting character trait of the president's. Elaborating, Panetta explained, that's not a failing of ideas or of intellect, but listen to this. Still, Mr. Obama does sometimes, in Panetta's words, lack fire. Then came Panetta's most cutting and much quoted observation. Too often, said Leon Panetta, in my view, the president relies on the logic of a law professor rather than the passion of a leader. The logic of a law professor. What could be wrong with that? How do you get the suggestion that there's something inherently illogical about law professors? That's what I wanted to know. And it's pretty clear that Panetta was on to something. Okay, let's think about some other interesting things that might support Panetta's statement. Consider that man. I'll show you another picture, same picture of him a little bit later. That's Duncan Kennedy, okay? He's one of the leaders of the critical legal studies movement, which arose in the academy. I'll show you some more leaders of that movement in a few minutes in the 1980s. In the 1980s early, when it looked like the world was heading to the left. And this movement captured the imagination of a lot of the legal community. Kennedy had a view of law professors too. He went to Yale, and here's what Kennedy said. Listen again carefully. One of the first and most lasting impressions that many students have of the law school is that the teachers are either astoundingly intellectually self-confident or just plain smug. <laughs> Many of them seem to their students to be preening themselves before their classes. In most cases, each gesture seems to say, I am brilliant. I am famous in the only community that matters. I am doing the most difficult and most desirable thing in the world and doing it well. I am being a law professor. I have to confess, that's how I've lived my life for the last 40 years, and it's a lot of fun. But there's a problem, a problem, I think. Leon Panetta put his finger on it. Here's somebody else who wondered, is there a problem? Listen to this. That's John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Like, by the way, all his brethren on the court these days, he's a graduate of an elite law school, in his case, Harvard. He declared, believe it or not, John Roberts, that the sort of things law professors now publish in the law reviews, I'm quoting exactly, is of limited to no value for those actually dealing with the law. Pick up a copy of any law review that you see, and the first article is likely to be, you know, the influence of Immanuel Kant on evidentiary approaches in 18th century Bulgaria or something, which I'm sure was of great interest, the Chief Justice said, to the academic that wrote it, but isn't of much help to the bar. The Chief Justice remarks, by the way, prompted a tongue-in-cheek study of the influence of Immanuel Kant on evidentiary approaches in 18th century Bulgaria by a guy named Oren S. Kerr, professor at uh, George Washington University School of Law. He quite properly concluded there was no such influence. <laughs> Be that as it may, how could anybody think that? How could anybody think that that's what law professors do? How could the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court think that? Okay, now you've got the problem, I think, laid out for you. Let me tell you about when things were different, okay? The way things once were. 
And again, each of these folks is a chapter in the book. Consider that man. That's Sir William Blackstone. Sir William Blackstone, in many ways, is the very first modern law professor. He taught at Oxford, but he wasn't like our era's law professors. He believed, Blackstone did, that the law was really divinely inspired. Now, we're talking here about the English common law. He believed that the job of a judge was simply to tell you what the law was, the so-called declarative theory of law. And he believed that was not difficult. Indeed, he went so far as to say that it would be a huge mistake for judges to try to do equity in their decisions, to be fair rather than simply to follow the law laid down. Equity without law would lead to unpredictability and chaos, he thought. Law without equity, just following the rules, was a better solution. For a long time, that was the view of the law. I could say more, but you get a little bit of that idea. In the book, the chapter on Blackstone is followed quickly with the chapter on James Wilson. James Wilson, who might be regarded as the first American law professor, taught at what became the University of Pennsylvania. And his job was to try to fashion Blackstonian common law, the English common law for America, and indeed to argue that it was compatible with popular sovereignty, with rule by the people, the only justification really for law in America. And he did quite an astonishing job on that. Like Blackstone, he thought law was tinged with the divine. Like Blackstone, he thought the law was clear and certain. And that's what he told his students in the late 18th century. The third figure in the third chapter in the book is Joseph Story. Story was a Supreme Court justice and a chaired professor at Harvard. He was also, interestingly enough, the president of the Bank of Salem and the Salem Savings Bank. And nobody saw any conflict among those three roles, which is really interesting. Why was that? Again, I think it was because of a conception that the law was quite certain, that it wasn't the job of judge to alter the law. Story also believed that American law was firmly undergirded with religion, and that American law was firmly undergirded with morals. Okay? Again, there's a lot more detail to that, but that's enough, I think, to suggest a little of what these folks believed, and I'm going to call that the orthodox view of law, the rule of law, the job of judges as to declare the law. Not only is it not entirely absent these days, I think in the popular imagination, in a way, that's what judges are still thought to be doing. But do they? What happened? Well, here's what happened. Things changed. Here's the villain, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Now, take a look at that man. He became famous. He became famous, the usual way of describing him is, as the only genuine American sage of the law. The only American sage of the law. He wrote a book called The Common Law, and he gave a speech called The Path of the Law. The Common Law, which a current judge, just retired, Richard Posner, claims is the best book about American law ever written. It's an extraordinary book, very dense book. Almost no one has read it, but it became extraordinarily famous, and it's got some very famous paragraphs in it. To summarize the argument for just a moment that Holmes made, the life of the law, he said, is not logic. It's experience. The law, at any given time, pretty nearly corresponds to what is then regarded as convenient. The law at any given time pretty nearly corresponds to what is then regarded as convenient. That's extraordinary. Judges, he said, perhaps unconsciously, here he anticipated Freud a little bit, judges, perhaps unconsciously, 
are fashioning the law to suit the needs of the times. That's an amazing statement. Now, these ideas of Holmes have captured the academy completely. This man is venerated more than anyone else in the legal pantheon. So I like to ask from time to time, why is that? Why is Holmes taken to be so extraordinary? Take a look at him. Who does he look like? Now, there are a couple of answers that immediately have sprung into your minds. One, he looks a lot like Mark Twain. He also looks a lot like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> but I'll tell you who else he looks like. Here it comes. You saw it. They're deep in your subconscious. He looks like Holmes does God. <laughs> okay, that's from the Sistine Chapel. And when you look like God, you can get away with a lot of interesting jurisprudential statements. There's more. I got to tell you, I'm not a fan of Holmes. Nearly everybody is. But one of the things about Holmes is he thought you could separate law from morality. Indeed, he said in one of his more famous utterances, you ought to think about the law the way a bad man would. The bad man theory of law. What I mean by law, said Holmes, is what the courts will do in fact. That's it. Wow. Okay. Sometimes we call that legal positivism. But it's a rather arid view of the law. Now, really, Holmes was attacking, when he did all these things, that man. That's Christopher Columbus Langdell, the dean at Harvard when Langdell, uh, sorry, when Holmes uh, gave his famous Path of the Law speech, the dean at Harvard when he wrote The Common Law. That man, Christopher Columbus Langdell, said Holmes in an anonymous book review, is the country's leading legal theologian. Leading legal theologian. He believes that the law is clear. He believes that the law is all about principles and that the law is all about logic. It's not, said Holmes. Well, that set things going, and we never really looked back after that. Things then got worse, OK? More people who are subjects of chapters in the book, just to give you a tiny bit of a flavor for this. There's one of them. That's Roscoe Pound, OK? a good Nebraska boy who went and became the dean at Harvard for a while. Pound thought, you know, the law in the books isn't really what's happening out there in the real world. I think what we need is more attention to the real world operations of law. I think what we need is a sociological approach to the law. And when Holmes was dean at Harvard, he did bring law professors into touch with a lot of disciplines. He was close, Pound was, to Talcott Parsons, for example, a famed sociologist at Harvard, to some of the psychologists, to some of the other people from the arts and sciences from that day to this, from the, uh, I guess, 20s and 30s. Interdisciplinary approaches to the law have been very popular. Thinking about the law, criticizing the law, maybe even suggesting changes based on other disciplines. Now, maybe that's not a bad idea, but it does make the law a little bit more malleable. More about that in a little while, all right? A couple other figures to call to your attention. Carl Llewellyn. Carl Llewellyn, like Pound, wanted to think about what was actually happening out there in the real world. He began to look at judicial decisions. And Llewellyn, who was regarded along with that man, that's Jerome Frank, as one of the two founders of legal realism, said, what the judges tell you is not really what decides cases. That's rationalization for the reasons that they want to reach. I think he was channeling Holmes when he said that. And this man, Jerome Frank, was even more radical in his approach. He wrote a famous book called Law and the Modern Mind, published in 1931. And the thesis of that book essentially was what I said about Llewellyn a few minutes ago. Judges don't really follow the rules laid down. The law is malleable. He's the author of the famous statement 
that sometimes what a judge had for breakfast will be more important in deciding the case than the rules of law. And I think Jerome Frank believed it. He wrote a whole book to say that. Bill Pitsy over there may remember that when we were students at Harvard Law School in uh, the late 60s, they gave us a reading list of books to read. And the first book on that list was Law and the Modern Mind. Now, law students and students generally being what they are, most of us, I suspect, only read that one book. And I think skewed our ideas about the law forever. I don't think what a judge had for breakfast is the most important thing about the law. But that's, was out, that's what was out there, this rather intriguing theory of rationalization of the opinions as rationalizing. Now that notion, legal realism's key notions, became, I think, a very important part in politics in the 1930s and in particular as articulated by that man, Franklin Roosevelt. You may remember that in the early years of the New Deal, the Supreme Court threw out many of the measures of the Roosevelt administration. This is outrageous, said Franklin Roosevelt, channeling, I think, the legal realists. The United States Supreme Court is telling Congress it doesn't have the power to solve the nation's problems. It's suggesting that things I want the federal government to regulate aren't interstate commerce. Now, I won't go into details on that unless you ask me later, but for the time being, just accept that he was right that the court was applying a pretty narrow conception of interstate commerce. Indeed, said Franklin Roosevelt, this is a horse and buggy conception of interstate commerce. Now the idea there is definitions of the law from the horse and buggy age don't fit modern times. But the implicit suggestion that Franklin Roosevelt was making is the judges can alter constitutional law to fit what they perceive to be convenient for the times, okay? Holmes's notion as articulated by the president. And pretty much FDR's attack on the court was successful. He didn't get to pass his court packing plan, but his huge victory in 1936, I think, signaled to the court, you got it wrong, you got to change. And that led to the famous, as it's called, switch in nine, where suddenly the Supreme Court reversed its views on interstate commerce. Suddenly, he got what he wanted out of the court. Suddenly, it became, I don't know whether to call it fashionable, usual, habitual, whatever, it became not uncommon to see the United States Supreme Court change the law. I think that prepared the way for the next huge titanic series of developments. They came through the work of that man, that's Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court who assumed that position in 1954. Now he was a great Chief Justice and the Warren Court did some extraordinary things. Brown versus Board of Education in particular, which mandated school desegregation. A lot of reforms of the criminal law. You're familiar with the Miranda case uh, that gave us the famous uh, warnings that everybody is entitled to and the warning that if you don't have a lawyer, one will be appointed for you. Anything that you say can and will be held against you and so on and so forth. There are other, I think, laudable things that the Warren Court did in order to promote justice. Indeed, Earl Warren often asked litigants before his court, yes, 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 counselor, but is it fair? Is it fair? Wow, lawyers aren't prepared for that kind of a question. Justice, the law, ought to be about fairness. Maybe it is. But what about the rules laid down? What about pre-existing precedents? What about that? Extraordinary stuff, okay? Changing the law very, very dramatically. The Warren Court did that. They also, as you know, were active in school prayer cases and a bunch 
of others. Now, a lot of people in the country had a lot of trouble with Earl Warren, not all of them for the right reasons. Impeach Earl Warren bumper stickers began to show up in some parts of the country. On the other hand, on the other hand, what the Warren court did transformed the nature of our government. Having the federal courts go into areas, education, criminal procedure, prayer in the schools, <clears throat> these may be things that you like, that they did, but they were rather unprecedented as judicial matters. So unprecedented, I think, that Dwight D. Eisenhower, who appointed Earl Warren and another justice uh, named William Brennan, great liberal justices. Dwight D. Eisenhower said, I made only two mistakes in my presidency, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. He was referring to Earl Warren and to William Brennan. Now, not everybody in the Academy says this, but I think the Warren Court did some extraordinary changing of law, maybe in the way that Holmes said it was okay for justices to do it. But that's different. It's not really what they were supposed to have been doing. Now, nevertheless, the name of the game since the Warren Court in the Legal Academy has been justifying what the Warren Court did, justifying their departures from the law. For example, that man, Ronald Dworkin, again, who just passed away very, very recently, wrote several books. One of the best of them is Taking Right Seriously, in which he said, well, all the Warren Court was doing was implementing principles that are inherent in the Constitution. We ought to really think about principles when we're judging rather than rules. But again, it's a prescription, I think, for extraordinary discretion on the part of courts. And as I say, it's become the name of the game in the academy to a great extent to do that. Here are two other folks who do sort of the same thing. This is Bruce Ackerman, that's Akhil Amar. Both Yale law professors, both enormously famous. Akhil Amar, by the way, has written a couple of books on the Constitution that can actually be read by normal human beings. That's very rare for a law professor. My book can too, of course. <laughs> but it's rare. Anyway, these two came up with an even more interesting theory. Their theory, they're the subject of a chapter in a book, is something called popular constitutionalism. And their thesis is you can amend the Constitution without bothering to use the Article 5 process, which requires a two-thirds vote by both houses of Congress and an affirmative vote by three-quarters of the state legislatures. If the people really want the Constitution to change, they can manifest that desire, say, by electing a president or, say, by accepting holdings, extraordinary holdings, of courts, because that's actually an exercise of popular sovereignty. That was a very exciting theory in the academy. Another way to put that is to suggest that what we've got in the Constitution is a living and breathing document. You've probably heard that phrase before. Does it make sense? A living and breathing document. A living and breathing document a living and breathing document. Antonin Scalia was very fond of saying, there's only one kind of constitution I like, and it's dead, dead, dead. Now, what he meant by that was, we ought to follow the original understanding. There ought to be one clear, unchanging interpretation. It makes a certain amount of sense. All right, now that's part of what was going on in the academy. I alluded to something else, and I'm painting in a little bit of a cartoonish manner, but not really all that much. If that isn't interesting enough for you, provocative and intriguing enough for you, consider critical legal studies up in the ante still more. Mark Tushnet at Harvard, rather famous person, wrote a Law Review article in which he said, you know, if I were a judge, what I would do is whatever it took to advance socialism in this country. I could have talked about that in today's class 
about Marx. I would disguise it, he said, with whatever grand theory of constitutional law is then currently fashionable. Now, that was when Marx was a bit younger, and I think he's backed off a little bit from that. But this movement, Critical Legal Studies, was quite sympathetic to that point of view. Morty Horwitz, my teacher at Harvard, a major mover and shaker in this jurisprudential theory, who wrote a book that won the History Fraternity's highest honor, the Bancroft Prize, called The Transformation of American Law, in which he suggested 19th century judges completely altered the law in order to meet the needs, really, of an emerging capitalist economy in the 19th century. A little bit of a Marxist analysis. He was my teacher, Morty Horwitz, absolutely brilliant. He said, I was the first of his students who really understood what he was saying and the first one to run screaming in the other direction. <laughs> and I think he had something with that. Here's Roberto Unger, another critical legal studies um, scholar who teaches at Harvard. Roberto Unger is a Brazilian, a brilliant Brazilian politician, an American scholar, tenured professor at Harvard. I'm told also one of the greatest of poets in the Portuguese language. This is an extraordinary figure. He too thought that the law was very, very malleable. He too wrote some extraordinary books that had an extraordinary impact. And I think the intellectual genius in the critical legal studies movement, Robert Gordon at Yale, who thinks similarly, Peter Gable. I don't know if you've ever watched um, What's My Line or to tell the truth. One of the panelists is uh, Arlene Francis. That's Peter Gable's mother. Peter became a very powerful scholar in critical legal studies and began to be a teacher out at the New School in California. Very brilliant young and talented radical. Okay, And Duncan Kennedy, who became associated with the critical legal studies movement. Now, if I were to sum up what they had to say, and I don't think I'd be exaggerating much, it would simply be the notion that law is just politics. Law is something that accomplishes political goals. It does not have a fixed meaning. Okay? I'm beginning to run a little bit out of time, and I want to begin to uh, end at least a little bit of this discussion. Okay? This is strange enough. Law is politics. Law maybe even is applied Marxism. Well, what about that? You can go even further, even more further out. Here's Catherine McKinnon, a leading feminist scholar, teaches uh, at the University of Michigan, visits at Yale from time to time. From a feminist perspective, she says, if you want to understand the law as it is now, you ought to understand it as part of the patriarchy that unfairly oppresses women. We need some major radical change. Patricia Williams, who teaches at Columbia and is one of the most prominent figures in something called critical race theory. Critical race theory is a lot like critical legal studies, except it focuses on race. And she suggests, she also writes a column, intriguingly enough, for The Nation, one of our more radical publications. That column is called Diary of a Mad Law Professor. It isn't clear whether she means she's angry or that she acknowledges that she's crazy. But the idea there is, and I think it's a valid point, really, the law marginalizes certain racial and ethnic groups. It shouldn't do that. We should be rethinking the law. We should be looking at the experience of our minorities and altering the law to take account of that unfair treatment. Something in that, without a doubt, whether it ought to lead to radical reconstruction is maybe something that isn't quite as obvious. Okay, Third figure, just to point out, that's Cass. Sunstein. I don't know how many of you know who Cass Sunstein is. He became a very famous law professor at Chicago. He's now at Harvard. He's married to Samantha Power, the former UN ambassador, and the two of them, I think, are very, very impressive. He went to Harvard, I think, to be with her at one point. Cass is the author of an amazing number of books. One of them is called Nudge, which he wrote with Richard Thaler, a very distinguished economist. The thesis of that book 
behavioral economics is the area that it's in, says people don't really know what they want. They are prone to too many psychological errors, optimistic bias, for example. They'll think things are really better than they are. Self-interested bias. They'll think they're smarter than anybody else. Lots of other interesting psychological quirks. People can't judge for themselves because of these failings of humanity. So what we need to do is use the law to nudge them in the right direction. Now, it, Cass is, I'm trivializing a little bit of what Cass has to say. Cass says, you might call this libertarian paternalism. Libertarian paternalism. There is an oxymoron if you've ever heard one. Other folks aren't so sure. Not that these are necessarily reliable interpreters, but Glenn Beck and Alex Jones, when he was cast in the Obama administration as the head of the Office of Regulatory Affairs, said, this is the most dangerous man in America. Hmm. Amazing, okay, I don't know how they knew about him. Now, I don't think he's so dangerous, he's rather a nice guy, but the legal theory that he's advancing might well be dangerous. Now, lest you think it's cause for despair, not quite, okay? A possible rear guard action has been fought all along. Not dominant in the law schools, but still out there, just to give you some indications. Here's Herbert Wexler, okay? He taught at Columbia, and he was deeply disturbed by the Warren Court. He thought, wait a minute, what they're doing isn't really what judges are supposed to do. Judges are supposed to follow, he said, neutral and general principles. They're not supposed to decide cases based on the outcome that they prefer. This took the legal world by storm, especially given what Holmes had to say. And his article, Neutral and General Principles of the Law, is one of the most cited in the canon. I'm not quite sure how often it's followed, but that meant the Warren Court had its critics. Here's another really interesting critic. That's Paul Carrington, the dean at Duke for a long, long time. He wrote a blistering attack on critical legal studies. These people don't really believe in the law. He may have gone just a bit too far. He said they're legal nihilists. They don't think there's any content to the law. Now, maybe they have a place in the academy, he said, which I think means they ought to leave law schools and maybe go to political science departments or religion departments or sociology departments, but they don't belong in the law schools. That was not terribly well received. It sounded like, to many critical legal studies professors, a return of McCarthyism, red baiting. Why are you hanging out, asked Robert Gordon, with the rednecks of the profession? Interesting set of questions. I happen to like Paul Carrington. The chapter that I wrote on him is very favorable indeed, and I like the man even more because he bought five copies of the book, <laughs> which I think he probably gave to his friends and family. Why not? Another voice crying sometimes in the wilderness, Scalia, when he was a law professor at Virginia and Chicago. The only good constitution is a dead constitution. You don't want a living constitution. Okay? Another intriguing voice. Mary Ann Glendon. Okay? Mary Ann Glendon teaches at Harvard. And Mary Ann Glendon is a rarity in the American Legal Academy. The American Legal Academy leans left, sometimes very far so. The American Legal Academy is basically secular. Okay? Mary Ann Glendon is a very committed Catholic Christian woman, almost unheard of in the academy. She is, by the way, or was for a long time, the United States ambassador to the Holy See. That is, she was our representative to the Vatican. It's a very unusual job for an American law professor. She wrote on jurisprudence. She wrote an extraordinary book on rights. She said, you know what's wrong with our legal system? Too much emphasis on rights, not enough emphasis on responsibility. I'm 
simplifying it very, very much, but that's the idea. So there are those people fighting the good fight, and then, of course, there's me <laughs> writing the book that I've been talking about. I don't think the cause is lost. I think it's still worth fighting for. Let me put it a slightly different way for you, and then I'll conclude. Okay? I think that there is out there, there has been, maybe it's time for a bit more of it, an attempt to look back to the past, to look to what Alexander Hamilton said when he drafted the famous Federalist 78 that justified judicial review. He said, judges, I'm paraphrasing, judges mustn't make the law. If you have a judiciary that legislates, you've got tyranny. He was quoting Montesquieu when he said that. Here's somebody else. This is a pretty obscure guy. His name is Samuel Chase. He was, by the way, the only United States Supreme Court justice ever to be impeached. The Jeffersonians didn't like him. They tried to remove him from the bench. Now, they didn't like him because he was a zealous advocate of the seditious libel law, and he believed, he said, by the way, there are only two ways, think about this, there are only two ways to ruin a republic, an excess of luxury and the licentiousness of the press. The Jeffersonian press didn't like that, but I wonder whether there wasn't some timeless wisdom in those words. He said something else that I find really intriguing, Samuel Chase. He said in his grand jury charges, you may not except this. But he said, you know, you can't have order without law. You can't have law without morality. And you can't have morality without religion. Now that's an orthodox 18th century view. Not everybody would buy it today. But I think there's something there. I think there's something worth thinking about there. What is the rule? What is the role of religion and morality in the law. Anthony Kennedy, Supreme Court Justice, in his opinions, has basically flat out said, there is no rule, role for morality in the law. It's up to each person to decide for themselves their own morality. Maybe, but is that really realistic? Is that what morality is all about? I think there's some different ideas floating around out there. And I think maybe it's time for more law professors to think about those different ideas. We ought to be reading us law professors, people like that man, that's Russell Kirk. Russell Kirk is the author of The Conservative Mind. Russell Kirk wasn't a lawyer, but Russell Kirk understood lawyers and law professors better than most of them. And he said some things, I won't talk in detail about them, but he said some things that are very like what Alexander Hamilton and what Samuel Chase said. So I think there's hope. I think there's hope. And I think that a lot of that hope comes from looking at our tradition. A lot of that hope is in the sort of things that this center is promoting. And a lot of that hope, I think, is stuff that this extraordinary school is thinking about, which is why I'm out here talking about this stuff. And that's all that I have to say on it. Thank you. You don't mind taking some no, questions? No, that's, that's right. the whole idea, I think. It's like a friendly enough audience. Maybe I'll just let you... Uh, sure. Uh, any questions? There's usually something that I've provoked. Le yes, sir. So I'm curious, your, your take on... You've argued about religion and morality. Uh, the debate about the constitutional interpretation with and without natural law um, and where interpretation would go awry without that, if it would. Is the question, do I think that that's correct? Yes. Yes, I do. And you know who you probably are uh, thinking about here? It's Clarence Thomas. In his hearings when he was confirmed, he said, you know, if you take a look at the Declaration of Independence, and if you take a look at the contemporary 18th century thought, you see that they do believe there are some timeless truths from natural law, to quote Cicero for a minute. Cicero said, I believe there's one law, valid here and everywhere. 
valid in Greece, valid in Rome, valid in Jerusalem for all times. I do think there are some timeless principles that we try to recapture occasionally in our law. Now exactly where we go with those is a little uncertain. I tend to think that the way to cabin natural law, which could open up you know, huge areas for judges uh, deciding cases, is to look at what it's meant historically not to use it as an avenue to open up everything, but to use it as a conservative tool, maybe to bring us back to an earlier understanding. So the short answer to your question is yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I really enjoyed the talk a lot. Um, I was kind of wondering if you could say a thing or two about your thoughts on uh, the role of faith and discourse in American law schools in particular, because I sort of looking at your title, you say, I, I think that what you describe is exactly what ought to be going on in the law schools, but I'm not sure it is. Uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, for too long, one view has dominated the law schools. Um, now, it shows up, this may or may not really be a valid criticism, but it shows up, for example, um, in the politics of people in the law schools. It's overwhelmingly on one side. You look at political contributions, they're not distributed among the parties at all. I think that suggests that not really an effective discourse is going on. And I think there is a need for one. But you know, I'm at an age where uh, you think, après moi, le déluge. Maybe it's not as bad as that. And in fact, there is an extraordinary phenomenon in the law schools, and that's the rise of the Federalist Society founded by a colleague of mine uh, named Steve Calabrese and a few others uh, from Yale. The thesis of that society is we've forgotten the constitutional notions of separation of powers and federalism, and it's time to bring them back. That's the fastest growing law school organization out there. And when um, Donald Trump says, I'm going to pick my judges with the help of the Federalist Society, you know something interesting is going on. So maybe there's more debate than I give credit to that's going on. And maybe a lot of it is prompted by the students and not necessarily the professors. Great question. Okay, more. Yes, sir. So as I understand it, you're a candidate for the same scholar and conservative thought. That's correct. Um, so could I just ask a little bit about sure. that? Well, that's a fabulous question. Um, and it's a really nice question whether an individual scholar in that program has the job of bringing balance or whether, as I suspect, the people brought in have a view that's different from that prevailing in the academy. So the theory is you listen to them, you listen to everybody else, and that's where you find your balance. I don't know if that's satisfactory, but that's the way I understand it. Well, no, I'm going to give you what I believe. And I think, well, I mean, and I should say, of course, that's right. But be that as it may, it's not the prevailing view. Not the prevailing view in the arts and sciences and not the prevailing view uh, in the law schools. But it would be wrong for me to do anything but articulate what it is that I believe, I think. Now, to be fair, whenever you do something like that, I think it's your obligation, if there is a clearly competing view that's out there, to articulate it, to explain the reasons uh, that support it, and to explain why you don't find those reasons persuasive. 
And I tried to do that a little bit in this talk. I don't know if I really did. It's hard. Uh, There's really, I mean, by using the word balance, you trigger some really interesting things. Chuck Schumer, you may or may not be aware. Um, in, uh, in hearings in the early 2000s, advised by Cass Sunstein, uh, held Senate uh, hearings on whether there should be a balance in the judiciary between different judicial ideologies, by which I think he meant um, the view that the Constitution is a living document and the view that Scalia holds that it's not. Okay? Now, to me, that was like saying there ought to be a balance on the bench between right and wrong. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's important to articulate those things. That's a great question. Yes, sir. The futility? No, utility. Oh. The utility of, of this sort of understanding. So common law is, I guess the way I look at it, the collective wisdom of history. Very good. It evolves over time. And there's sort of an implicit suggestion in this way of looking at things. And I largely subscribe to it. But there's an implicit suggestion that we sort of stopped at, at 1776 or 1787. That was it. We, we peaked natural law. We, we got it, and we should still. Just like just like Hegel thought perfection was reached in the Prussian state in the late nineteenth century, right. or whatever. And Hegel is completely unreadable if anyone's ever tried. <laughs> I guess just moving forward, that there's got to be a, a balance struck at some point between this understanding of all those good things that did happen in 1787 and 1776. And then yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, and it's a, it's a great question to, and I'm not sure you can articulate mathematically exactly where the balance is, but you can say some things. First of all, when you talk about the common law, we're generally talking about private law. We're talking about torts, contracts, property, uh, and other uh, civil law areas. But I'm talking a lot about constitutional law. And I don't believe that constitutional law change ought to happen the way common law change happens. I believe that you've got a mechanism inside the Constitution, Article 5. Uh, you've got the opportunity in a lot of areas to legislate, both at the state and federal level. And legal changes in public law, I think, might be better handled through those means. Now, for me, that's one way to strike the balance. Um, there, there are other things that one can say about that, but it seems to me that the common law method is not a license for judges to legislate. And that's really the only point that I'm trying to make. Yes? There's a piece in the journal, I think, today that implies, if not outright, alleges that the ABA leans so far left that the recommendations I didn't get a chance to read that, but I'm sympathetic to that view. <laughs> um, and and it's, it is strange, but, but, and I, I don't mean to disparage their efforts. Occasionally, um, I've been asked to participate in some of those judicial evaluations. <laughs> Not recently, I might add, but uh, there was a time. So I think there's good faith being employed there. But I think the jurisprudential perspective in the ABA in a lot of sectors of the Democrats and in a lot of the academy just may be fundamentally flawed. And using that perspective as the only way to judge, uh, I think, leaves something to be desired. Um, Scalia, strangely enough, uh, I mean, it's like burning your draft card. He burned his ABA card <laughs> and, and refused uh, to be associated with it. Uh, I'm not sure I go that far, but I have some difficulties. All right, I've kept you for an hour. Thank you very much.